Hey everyone, I'm back and just in time to get to grips with NVIDIA's new GeForce GTX 1080 Ti. Yes, this is the one we've been waiting for. NVIDIA's worst kept secret, a consumer level version of its epic Titan X Pascal. Now going into this one, I had several questions. First of all, how has NVIDIA cut down this card so the $1,200 Titan can retain some kind of value premium? Secondly, does the TI live up to the company's claims that it can outperform its more expensive counterpart? And finally, is it really 35% faster than the existing GTX 1080? But first up, let's take a look at the card itself. And you can see that, yes, this Founders Edition is very much cut from the same cloth as NVIDIA's premium Pascal products that are on the market right now. Put the TI here side by side with GTX 1080 and it looks pretty much the same, but there have been some changes, just like Titan X Pascal. The 8-pin power input at the top is supplemented with a secondary 6-pin socket, effectively confirming that this is a GPU with a 250-watt TDP. But perhaps more surprising is that NVIDIA's standard port configuration on the rear has been changed up. The Dual-Link DVI port seen on every other top-tier GPU from NVIDIA well, that's gone. Now, if one interface did have to receive the chop, Dual Link DVI would be the one to get rid of. It's the only connection on the rear here that cannot support 4K at 60 Hertz. Anyway, the good news is that removing the port has allowed NVIDIA to optimize airflow for better cooling. In fact, in this regard, the firm reckons there's a 2x improvement. And that's pretty good news as Titan X Pascal's overclocking was very much limited by its thermals. And I can confirm that this is much improved on the 1080 Ti here. Now, comparing the 1080 Ti to Titan X, you'll need to dig a little deeper to find any meaningful differences. CUDA core count is identical at 3584 spread across 28 streaming processors, but NVIDIA has tweaked base and boost clocks to exceed the Titan's shader performance. The big difference though comes in memory configuration. Bizarrely, NVIDIA has cut the Titan's 12 gigs of G5X memory down to, well, 11. It's hardly a massive downgrade and it makes you wonder what the point actually is especially as it has an impact on other areas of the card's design. So for example, ROPS dropped from 96 to 88 and the 384-bit memory bus is reduced to 352-bit instead. This doesn't sound so good to me to be honest. Memory bandwidth is crucial at 4K resolution, but Nvidia's solution here is to swap in new 11 gigabit per second G5X modules. So overall bandwidth is actually a minuscule improvement over the Titans, despite all of this meddling. But the bottom line is that with the additional boost clocks, in every way that matters, this card should be a better performing product than the Titan. So let's take a look at Assassin's Creed Unity performance here. I like to include this game in my benchmarks for a couple of reasons, even though it's so old. First of all, its ultra high settings are a massive workout for the GPU, even three years on from release. And secondly, Nvidia and AMD don't really optimize for this title specifically in newer drivers. So it's always good for measuring baseline performance and comparing to older results. And here we've got a 7.6% uplift on TI at 4K, though curiously there's no change at all in our 1440p results. But the graph sort of highlights how much of a muchness this all is. Moving over to The Witcher 3 here, both 1440p and 4K gains a couple of FPS when moving to 1080 Ti. Now across the run of play again it's sort of looking identical, but the slight boost stacks up as the bench plays out. I mean it's not game changing, but optimizing for a 4K gameplay experience typically involves battling against your lowest frame rates. So every little helps, I guess. And for me, the key sell with the 1080 Ti is the fact that this card will propel you to 60 FPS at 4K, even on some really demanding games. Now, of course, you may need to tweak settings and take some visual downgrades, many of which you may not even notice. But the 4K credentials of this card are sound and we can demonstrate its scalability beautifully. Right, so let me explain that. I think we can all agree that GTX 970, 1060, RX 480 are all great cards for 1080p gaming. So what if we compare the 1080p results of that trio with the 4K results of the 1080 Ti? Now with our benchmark data, that's exactly what we can do and we get some fascinating results. Let's start off with Far Cry Primal. 
The 1080 Ti at 4K is a touch slower than RX 480. It lags behind GTX 1060, but it's outperforming the 970. Remember, the new card is rendering four times as many pixels, and that's a remarkable turnout. Minimum frame rate here is 55 FPS, so minimal tweaking from the ultra level settings here should keep us north of 60. And there's a similar pattern with the division here. The 1080 Ti at 4K can't quite match the 1060 at 1080p, but it's actually on level ground with the RX 480. The pattern continues here with our demanding Novigrad City benchmark from The Witcher 3. Only the 1060 at 1080p beats the 1080 Ti at 4K. I mean, it's a remarkable turnout here, and if you've been keeping an eye on the frame times, you'll note that the 1080 Ti isn't just delivering the raw frame rate, it's delivering on fluidity too. But let's be completely upfront about this. Not every game will see this exceptional level of scalability across resolutions. Rise of the Tomb Raider at its very high preset is a game that will push any GPU to its limits the higher up the resolution chain you go. And compared to the less capable cars running at 1080p, it's significantly slower. Now this title is actually one where it is really difficult to get a solid 4K 60 log, which is perhaps not surprising when GTX 1060 at 1080p commands a 24% performance lead over the 1080 Ti at 4K. And older games, releases conceived at a time where 4K was just a crazy pipe dream. Well, the most demanding of those may also cause issues. As we check out our Crisis 3 benchmark, there's a huge gap between 1080 Ti at 4K and 1060 at Full HD. The cheaper card is actually offering a 78% boost in frame rates. But in the meantime, we can overclock. It's something I'd recommend with a third-party card rather than Nvidia's, as you really need to ramp up the fans here to keep things cool, and this kicks up quite a bit of noise. But overall results from overclocking aren't too shabby. Adding 170 megahertz to the core should keep you at two gigahertz or in that general area. And that's something I could never achieve with Titan X Pascal. However, the 11 gigabits per second G5X on 1080 Ti doesn't have anything like the same level of overclocking headroom as the slower modules on the vanilla 1080 and the Titan. I could only add around 150 megahertz here, and that's just a smidgen faster than I could comfortably overclock the RAM on the older cards. And as you can see, this translates into an uplift in the region of around 10% performance. The days of the insane Maxwell era overclocks are well and truly gone. But with that said, the notion of a chip of this size hitting two gigahertz is pretty insane. It'll be interesting to see how third party cards compare. But typically, overclocking with Pascal has been limited by the processor itself, not its thermals. At the very least though, the custom coolers should be significantly quieter than the reference card here. So there we go, GTX 1080 Ti, it's a bit of a monster. But I feel it's really important to point out the extent of this card's power and how it should be deployed. Let's go to The Witcher 3. Here, we're comparing our benchmarks across 1080p, 1440p and 2160p. 4K if you like. Yes, the 1080p result is pretty insane, but note how the frame rate line isn't consistent and also note the stutter in frame times. What's happening here is that we are actually hitting CPU limits, even though we're using an i7 6700K overclocked to 4.6 gigahertz. Put simply, there's a strong argument that this card is simply too powerful if you're planning to game at 1080p. You're leaving a lot of performance on the table by doing that. And note how relatively close 1080p and 1440p performance is here in Hitman, to the point where sometimes performance actually hits exactly the same level. Now this is a CPU intensive game and although frame rates are stupidly high, Clearly the GTX 1080 Ti should be performing better at 1080p. We're hitting the limits of our system here, even though we are running using the DX12 API. And yes, Crisis 3, look, this game is approaching its fourth birthday now, but holy crap, it can still monster a modern i7. Again, note how 1080p performance varies so dramatically more so than the 1440p and 4K readouts. Yes, that's what happens when you have a GPU that's too powerful at lower resolutions, even when you have one of the fastest gaming CPUs on the market right now. The Witcher 3, Crisis 3, Hitman, they could all hit CPU hard, but even 
Less challenging titles like Far Cry Primal, well, check this out. Note how the 1080p and 1440p lines here are intersecting. Again, in this area, performance is limited by the heavily overclocked i7, not the 1080 Ti. Bottom line, we actually need more CPU power at 1080p. Okay, so that's all worth bearing in mind then. And it explains why scalability over the vanilla GTX 1080 varies depending on your resolution. Across eight tested games, the GTX 1080 Ti is 23% faster at 1080p, 27% faster at 1440p, and 31% faster at 4K. Really and truly, it's only really at 4K where CPU is completely ruled out and we see the full brutal power of the TI. Okay then, so this is the third GPU King Nvidia has rolled out in less than a year and alongside Titan X Pascal, the performance on offer here is absolutely phenomenal. And yes, of course, so is the price point. $700 US, £700 UK, that's a fat pile of cash whichever way you slice it. Obviously, that is indeed a huge reduction from the Titan's ludicrous asking price, but it's important to understand that the capabilities of this card will vary according to your system, primarily CPU, and of course depending on resolution. But go in looking for the best 4K GPU money can buy and you won't be disappointed. Anyway, I hope this was useful. Yes, I've been away, and yes, I will be reviewing Ryzen next, so do look out for that. But in the meantime, as always, please support Digital Foundry, whether that's through liking, subscribing, or supporting our Patreon, where you can grab pristine download versions of all of our videos. But that's all I've got for you for now. Thanks for watching.